Well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Ian, Ian Small, uh, and thank you for joining this evening and, and Happy New Year to you all. Uh, over the next hour, I hope to bring some colour and uh, theoretical warmth, at least, to, uh, to a very cold winter evening. Um, what I'm going to be doing is sharing with you uh, photographs of 100 or so species of neotropical butterflies that I've seen in either in the Andes themselves or in the, the lowlands and tropical forests just to the east of them. Um, so where am I talking about? I, my, for some reason, my screen isn't going forwards. My screen has frozen, having been working perfectly. There we go. Um, so just an orientation. So this is South America, dominated by the large size of Brazil, as you can see. And where all these photographs were taken were in Peru, which I visited in 2016, and in Bolivia, which I had the pleasure of visiting last year. Um, as you can see from this slide, that the Andes run, run through both of those countries uh, and, and really get very high. The, the, the top peaks you can see here are sort of 6,700 metres, 6,800 metres, which is really quite high. I didn't get that high on, on where I was going, uh, but the the highest sites I visited were you now highlighted on this line there, and these these areas were between three and just over four and a half thousand meters. So four thousand six hundred, which we got to, is is fifteen thousand feet. So to give you, if you're used to that nomenclature, gives you a feel for just how we were. Lower sites, um, down the one that's just highlighted there is about a thousand meters up, just just off the side of the Andes. What I should have pointed out at the start, top right, you can see the Amazon coming in here. And essentially all this area here is referred to as the Amazon Basin or Amazonia. Then the other sites that the photographs come from, this, this dark colored one here um, is actually Santa Cruz where the airplanes fly in and out of from, from Europe. Uh, and they have a, a remarkably large botanic gardens there where, where several of the photographs were taken. And that's about 400 meters above sea levels. Um, the, the paler pink areas here are very much tropical forest areas. And they range from a maximum of about 300 meters above sea level to just 100 meters or so. So why did we go there? Um, in a word, that word is biodiversity. Uh, and that biodiversity is driven by the Andes themselves. Uh, because they, they offer such a phenomenal range of habitats and microclimates that that drives a huge range of, of all life, you know, animals and plants uh, occupying all those different niches. Uh, and to put some numbers on that, uh, Peru has over 4,000 species of butterfly. Bolivia has around, around about 3,500. I mean, things are being discovered all the time, so these numbers are not static things. But to put that in perspective, the whole of Europe has around about 350 or so. So each of these countries has 10 times as many butterflies as the whole of Europe. So for the rest of the presentation, it's going to be a whistle-stop overview of each of the butterfly families from, from, from this, this region. Um, I've sorted it out by family rather, rather than by altitude or anything else, because it's just easier to go through. But what I'll try and do is I'll try and call out where species are particularly found either at very low levels in the tropical rainforests or conversely very high in the mountains. And, and obviously I've only seen a fraction of the butterflies that these habitats have to offer. And in the time we've got, which is just an hour or so, then I can only share with you a, a fraction of, of, of what I saw. But as I say, we'll start going through by family, and I'm going to start, start with the skippers, the Hesperiidae. Um, and these are incredibly abundant in, in what's called the Neotropics, um, which is essentially from the, the very southeast tip of Mexico through Central America and, and down through South America, down, down through Argentina. So that, that's the area we refer to as the Neotropics. But the, the, there's between two and three thousand species of skipper in 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 that region, which is just an astronomical number. Um, but an awful lot of them are grass skippers, um, like like on the slide here at the moment. And the, and many of them are very very difficult for the sort of casual visitor to identify, simply because they often you don't see the characteristic features. So I have no idea what this particular species on this slide is, uh, because it has no distinguishing features that allow me to to, to pick it out. 
But what I will do is, is go through some examples of each of the, the other groups of skippers other than the grass skippers. So things called fire tips, long tail skippers and spread wing skippers. And I'm going to start with a really spectacular fire tip skipper and this Krasinga fire tip. Uh, and you really see, you know, where the name fire tip comes from with these. Um, the brightness of that that red on on the abdomen, and the fact that it's the same colour is picked up on the hairs on the head of the insect, you know, it just makes this stunning. I mean, this is uh, so this is sitting in the way that, for example, a, a large skipper would sit would sit, but it, it it's larger than that. Um, most of the far tips actually sit with their wings flat, like this next one, um, and this you know, the majority of the far tips have this general. Um, appearance of, of a sort of dark, dark blue overall color, but this phenomenally bright red fire tip on them, uh, matched by the same color on their heads. So really quite stunning insects. The next group of skippers um, are, you know, the the, the long tail skippers, um, and you know. These were quite a surprise me when I first came across them because the, the concept of, of butterflies with long tails like this in, in, skip, in the skipper family was uh, was foreign to me. But there's actually quite a few of these, um, and the majority are you know of this sort of character. They're, they're generally browns with dark, with darker and lighter patterns on the upper and underside. Although some of them have have blue on the upper side as well. But there are also white skippers. Um, so two examples here. Orcus on the left is 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 really quite quite widely distributed, um, you know, from Central America southwards, uh, and I've certainly seen it up to about fifteen hundred meters in height. It looks a bit reminiscent of our European grizzled skippers, uh, and until fairly recently, it was actually thought to be in the same family. It was it was it was classified as a pergus like like our skippers, like our grizzled skippers, uh, but. DNA testing uh, showed that not to be the case. And, and the other white skipper here is, is one I've only seen, seen the once when I took this photograph. And this was one of the species we saw in the Botanic Gardens in, in Santa Cruz, so fairly low level. And at first glance, these two spread wing skippers look fairly similar, uh, but you, you can see that there's differences in the in, in the, the lines radiating from the body on the left hand one, but running parallel to it on, on the right hand one. And, and these are completely different families of skippers. But I, what 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 surprises me is that there are at least a couple of dozen, perhaps more species of skipper that have this general blue and white lined pattern on them. Um, I have no idea what the, the biological advantage of that is. I, I assume it must relate to some sort of camouflage it confers, but you know, under what circumstances this, this provides camouflage, I, I, I really have no idea. Now, this is a large skipper. This is the giant sickle wing. Uh, it has a, a wingspan of just over two inches um, and this lovely scalloped shape to its wings. Uh, and these wonderful sort of mottled markings on it. So it just looks like dappled shade um, falling across the wings. And this next species is also a sickle wing, but it's like the smaller one. And this is the southern sickle wing. And you can see much better with the angle of this photograph what the shape of the wings is. You know, and it, it, it's this lovely curved outline to the wings uh, and a really quite interesting pattern. Uh, on, on the upper wings there, and that lovely blue sheen to it, you know. And and at first glance, you think, well, what a strange pattern. It must stick out like a sore thumb. But then again, you look at the the background that it's on. It's sitting on some disturbed ground, and that's exactly where this butterfly is routinely found. And and under those with that sort of background and that sort of habitat, you know, it it does tend to bl blend in fairly well, and sometimes can be quite hard to pick out against those those, those backgrounds. The same can't be said for this, though. Um, I have, you know, when I saw this, you know, my, my jaw dropped because I'd, I'd, I'd seen pictures of these in a book before. Um, but when you see this for, for yourself, that the brightness of, of the green on that, that, the metallic green on the head of this insect, it, it's just stunning. Um, and, you know, and then that radiates out with the, the, the these sort of fine green speckling as it radiates away from the body. 
Um, so it, I have no idea what survival advantage a pattern like that confers on a butterfly, um, but it's wonderful to see nonetheless. And on the left-hand side here, we've got something called the green flasher, Telegonus. And in contrast to what I've just been showing you, look how well the color of the butterfly matches the background and the leaf. The, the green is the exact match for the green leaf above it. And the browns and even the paler markings on the butterfly's wings are an exact match for the colors of the leaf that it's sitting on. Just really quite remarkable matching. Um, and, and obviously very, 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 very good for the butterfly staying hidden. And I include the one on the right uh, just as an example, because there are so many skippers which have the, this blue coloration uh, on the upper side, which, of course, is, is completely foreign to those of us who live in Europe. Uh, but it's, it, it really is quite a common occurrence in, in, in these neotropical skippers. So moving on from the skippers, the next family I'm going to, to talk about are, are the, the Papillonidae, uh, the Swallowtails and Cattle Hearts. Um, now, these are large, fast-flying butterflies, and as, as you probably well know, uh, and they're often quite difficult to, to see clearly. Um, and, and the species here on this slide is, 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 is here again, it's the, the same location. And again, this is another image taken in the Botanic Gardens in Santa Cruz, um, where these swallowtails are attracted to the red flowers. Now, now these are large swallowtails. They, they, they have about a five inch wingspan, uh, which puts them about time and a half, time and a half to wearing on for twice the size of the European swallowtails. Now, the under, underwing pattern, you know, we, we would recognize as a, as a swallowtail uh, underwing, but the, the upper sides are, are generally dark with, with this, this pattern of, of pale, pale markings on it. And that, 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 that approach is, is common across many of, of, of the neotropical swallowtail butterflies. So you see in this next Polydamus swallowtail, again, the upper wing is that same dark color with, with the, the paler spots across it. But on this occasion, the underwing is, is essentially matching. It's the same dark color. Um, and in this species, we have this wonderful ring of, of, of red marks around the body, sorry, around, around the, the margin of the hindwing, but also picked up by that line of dots uh, on, on the thought, at least on the body of, of the insect and, and also all those, all those dots. This swallowtail, on the other hand, doesn't have any red dots on the body, uh, but has this wonderful line of sort of red pupiled white ovals in it running across the hindwing. Related to the swallowtails are the cattle hearts, and, and if anything, they're, they're even more frenetic in their flight than, than the swallowtails are. Um, and these two species were flying side by side, and, and, uh, and, and we could tell, we could just just with the way the wings were flapping, we could just about make out that there was a difference in the pattern on the hind wings. Um, so the only way to actually see these clearly was to set my camera to a high speed burst and just hope that I managed to capture the odd frame with wings open and wings closed so I could see them clearly and, and hope to identify them. You know, and, and fortunately that worked in both cases. Uh, and, and as it turns out, they're actually subspecies of the same species, which largely differ you know, as I say, in that pattern of the red on, on, on the hindwing. But we really had no idea there were blue spots on, on, on the forewings of, of one of them because the wings were moving so quickly. It was just impossible to pick that, that level of detail up with a naked eye. So I'm going to move on quickly now to, to the period, the mimic whites, the whites, and the sulfurs. So, Mimic whites is a, is a slightly unusual term you may not be familiar with, but, but simply to say that, uh, that the wood whites that we have in Europe uh, are also classed as, as, as mimic whites. And, and it's just with a couple of those, I'll, I'll start off here. Um, and, and this one at the top that goes by the, the English name of the common mimic white, it, it, it's really quite an odd appearance. And I, I thought I was looking at a, an insect that had a, you know, a really nasty infestation of, 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 of orange mites of some sort. Um, but it appears, you know, from looking at all the photographs that I can find uh, of this species, that this actually that's not the case. And this is actually what the butterfly looks like. So it, it really is quite odd. 
And the, the, the species below, the Chrysia mimic white nut dysmorpha, dot dysmorphia, um, look, looks very delicate in the same way that our wood whites would do. But of course, none of our wood whites have any sort of yellow patches on them in the way that this one does. This white, on the other hand, is, is something really special in my mind. Um, it doesn't have an English name, um, just, so we just have the Latin name, Fulia. Um, but I found this species twice, both once in Peru and once in Bolivia. And in both cases, I was above 4,000 meters. Um, never seen it below 4,000 meters. Uh, and, and, and actually, it was closer to four and a half in, in, in Bolivia, where we saw it. Um, you can see that the, the ground where the, these butterflies are occurring is, is incredibly sparse. It's pretty barren. Um, any plants that there are are low growing close to the ground. Um, I can find no published information about how this butterfly survives at these altitudes. You know, so there's, there's no recorded information that I can find, at least about what its food plants are. Um, you know, how many years it might take, might even take to go through a life cycle. If you think, you know, at these altitudes, you know, how many months of the year is the ground frozen or under snow? Um, so the, the, the period during which the butterfly can, can, can actually emerge as an adult and, and, and go through those adult stages of the life cycle, it, it must be really very short. You know, but certainly it, it was not uncommon in either of the places that I found it. And the butterflies are really very active, flying in sunshine. This species was a bit lower, about 3,000 meters, this, this time in Peru, um, but it's incredibly bright underside to it. Um, and I, I look at this and, and I equate it to a, a green veined white, but perhaps one on steroids um, or some other psychedelic substance just to get that, those bright colors and that, that wonderful orange bar line around the, the leading edge of the, the wings there. And still sitting at that same sort of altitude of sort of 3,000 meters or so. Um, top right here, we have one of the dark whites. Um, and you look at the underside, and many of the dark whites have these in incredibly complicated cryptic patterns um, of, of light and dark, and, and, and in this case, all these yellow marks across it. And you think, wow, that's going to stick out like a sore thumb. But really, it doesn't, because as you can see with the behind it, at these altitudes, the light is very strong. And so the contrast between light and shade is immense. Uh, and, and as you can see here, those individual blades of grass give the impression of the, the same as, as those little yellow flashes on, on, on the underside of the butterfly. So in these habitats, that butterfly has incredibly good camouflage. And the, the butterfly below, um, many of you will think, is, as you look at that, oh, that looks like a clouded yellow. Yes, you're not wrong. It's the same coleus family as our European clouded yellows. And this looks reminiscent of a, of a, a mountain clouded yellow. But down in the lowlands and the rainforests, uh, um, this is one of my favorite butterflies. I, I've only seen it once. Uh, it's certainly one of my favorite white butterflies. And it goes by this, the lovely name of the snowflake. Um, it's incredibly small and incredibly dainty, as you can probably get, get the impression from the photograph. The, 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 the longest dimension, as you look sort of across the wings there, it, it's probably only 12 to 15 millimeters. So you know, half an inch, just a little bit more than half an inch across. And pure white on the wings, apart from the tiny sort of salmon pink smudge towards the body. And those lovely little green eyes poking out, looking at us. And when you look at the butterfly on the left here, you might be forgiven at first glance for thinking, oh, there's a brimstone. Uh, but no, this is actually quite a large orange tip uh, that's sitting there under this palm leaf. Um, the upper sides are pure white, apart from really quite broad orange tips, which now I've mentioned that you hope you can actually see shining through uh, onto the underside of the wings. So in terms of size, this is about time and a half the size of our, of our UK Brimston butterflies. And I include just one, one example of a sulphur on the right here, because th th there are many species that have 
this, this general coloration, and, and hence they're all called the sulfurs um, in, in the neotropics. And this particular one has the English name of the tail sulfur, and it, it, it's fairly obvious why, why that name was applied, isn't it? So I'm going to move on now to the, the Lycaenids, the, the, the coppers, the blues and hair streaks. Um, and again, there, there's a lot of these species uh, in, in, in this part of the world, but I found very few. Um, I found many, many more sort of up and towards Central America, but, but really quite few down in the regions that I'm this talk is focusing on. So I've never seen any of the coppers from, from the neotropics. And I've seen very few blues, in, certainly in, from, Peru, from Peru and Bolivia. Uh, so most of what I've seen has been hair streaks. The few blues that there are tend to be um, fairly similar in appearance. And the, the, these two are actually from the same family, the Leptotes uh, genus. Uh, Europe has one example of a Leptotes, and that's Lang's short-tailed blue. So if you're familiar with that species, the, these two may, may look similar to you. And you can see that the, the, the gender underwing pattern is very similar between these species and all, that, all that's differing is, is the way the, the ground colors are balanced. But what the Neotropics does have is a lot of green hair streaks. Uh, and, and these are two that I've come across and, and I'm particularly fond of the one on the left here, the Kramer's green hair streak. Um, it's got a small butterfly. But the color is just stunning. It, 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 it almost shines uh, in, in, in the light that I took this photograph in. You know, and that green, it, somehow the, that big black eye and just those faint light, faint black markings on, on the wings, just, just somehow uh, bring it to life in, in, in a sense. And just, just how it bright that, that butterfly is, just um, a real stunner, I find. The, Green streak on the right is is a bit larger, um, similar in size, but maybe slightly bigger than, than our, our UK green hair streak. But as you can see, the underside is 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 mottled in these sort of rusty uh, smears and, and dots, um, and it 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 really serves two purposes. It a, it breaks up the shape for for any potential predator, so it, it makes it more difficult for a predator to see the insect, but also Many of the leaves that these butterflies are, are sitting on and are, are also themselves exhibiting the same sort of pattern on the leaves. So it, it just all helps with the camouflage. The black hair streak on the left decided the best camouflage it could get was sitting on this black strap. So apologies that it's a, a non-natural place for it to sit, but unfortunately this was the only place that this butterfly sat. Um, and this this was something we, we saw once in, in Peru, and, and we were just below 2,000 meters, about 1,800 meters or so. Uh, but this has got a chunky hair streak. Um, really, it really looks quite, quite beefy as it sits there, doesn't it? And the Arawakis on the right is and exactly, it's probably the most common hair streak I've come across in, in, in the region. We've come across this one really quite regularly. Um, but it's one of a couple of families which have a, a similar pattern on their underwings. So, so this family, as you can see, has, has orange as well as these converging lines of black and white. The other family it omits the orange and just has the converging black and white patterns. Uh, but, but in each case, the, the those lines converge on eye spots, uh, and then the butterfly's tails uh, all serve to create effectively a false head on this insect. You know, clearly aimed at, at potential predators who are lulled into attacking the wrong end, and hence so improving the chances of survival of the insect in the event of an attack. So I'm now going to move on to the the next family, the Riodinids. Um, and these are quite an amazing family, really. We only have one, uh, one example in, in, in the UK, and I think in Europe, uh, the Duke of Burgundy. Um, but there, there are, as you can see on the slide, 1,300 or so of these in the Neotropics, because this is their home. Uh, and they are an incredibly varied uh, group of butterflies that they're, they're not that as you will see they're certainly not all the same in the, in, the, in their appearance. 
Um, and what what does characterize many, many of them is, is metallic colors on the wings. Um, and that's what leads to the English name of the metal marks for, for this group. And I'm going to start off by showing you three members of the of the same genus, the Retus genus. Um, and these, these are relatively commonly uh, found uh, because they they're, they're sort of user friendly, if you like, and that they like sunshine and they like they like taking uh, salt, you know, from 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 damp damp ground, as you can see here. And so, th this wonderful pattern on, on the wings, but those beautiful long tails, long blue tails, um, really really striking butterflies. So this is this is one Vita Tritus archaeus, the sword tail doctor. This next one is Dysonii, uh, which which is perhaps my favourite of, of, of the three of the genus. Uh, and you know the, the the extent of the blue is slightly greater, but look how bright that red is. It it shines. It it sort of leaps off the surface at you, and it, it's actually quite difficult to focus on in terms of. Precisely where is that? Is it at the same level as, as, as the butterfly wings? And the most common of the three retus is, 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 is the periander on, on the left here, uh, where the, the orange is slightly different shape and, and, and the blue, again, slightly different extent on the wings. But one of the English naturalists called the species on the right, the Ansalurus, also a doctor. Um, so. But as you can see, the the orange orangey red colouring of, of that is an exact match for the orangey red on this periander metal mark beside it. And, and, and this you know this combination of reds and reds and dark colours is is very common. So the next one I'll show you is is the same family as the Ansaluris. It's it's you know but this one is an even brighter red against that dark background. This particular butterfly has shorter tails uh, than the one I just showed you, but this strikingly almost luminous red against the dark background is is relatively common in in these metal marks. And so here we are again. And this this is perhaps the most common of the metal marks that one comes across, the red barred amaranthus. And, and this was obviously a very fresh specimen. But but again, look how bold and bright those colours are, um, and just the way that the the, the color of those the, those lines and marks on the wings are picked up by the, exactly the same color on on the body of the insect, you know, and and the rest of the uh, the wings it, it almost looks like a starry night. It's stars on a black background, isn't it? It, it really is quite, quite a stunning insect. And another you know, you were just seeing the dark backgrounds are quite common. The um, this Melanis family. Um, Go by the English name of the pixies, um, and this particular one is Smith's pixie. But but the the pixies are all essentially all have this, these black wings, um, and they're differentiated by you know the extent to which there are lines and dots in in in, in bright metallic colours on them. So, but things go to a different level altogether when you see something like this. This is one of the jewel marks. This is uh, Ronaldus, and you, know, you you see something like this. That this is in Amazon rainforest, um, and and you know you uh, you can tell my joy is dropping even as I look at giving this talk. Um, it is just such a stunning insect. It's just difficult to find words to describe how on earth something like this evolves and why it evolves in the way it does. Um, most butterflies don't have hairs on their legs, but the jewel marks do. But this one has pink hairs on its legs, and that pink colour is picked up on the, the hairs around the, the face of the insect. So you know, how nature arrives at these things is beyond me, but, but thank goodness it does, isn't it a treat? And as for this, I, it, it just looks like somebody has taken some cans of metallic paint and sprayed them on a brown butterfly. Um, it's wonderful green, luminous green stippling across the wings on, on this rainbow metal mark. Uh, and, and you can see it's aptly named the rainbow. It's, you can see blues and reds and, uh, and, and various other shades from different angles. But just 
you know, it, it doesn't seem real when you see something like this. It, it's just mind boggling how how something like this evolves and, and, and why it, why it is like this. I hadn't shown you blue on any of the metal rocks up till now, but, but here we are. This is a, a glittering sapphire, um, which is certainly blue and certainly lives up to its name. But many of the metal marks have, have a similar concept in that the, the ground color of the wings is, unif is a uniform color and all the markings are, are dark or black. So that's the case in, in all the, the Emesis family, which is the large family of, uh, of metal marks. And they differ in the, you know, just the precise shade of, of, of orange and brown that, that, that they have. But this, these are this is the, the noble emesis, you know, obviously a mating pair. So one of them is one of them at least is very fresh, although it looks like both are exceedingly fresh. But aren't the colours absolutely set off? It, it, it couldn't have asked for it as a photographer, I couldn't have asked for anything more uh, than to have these sitting on a cecropia leaf like this. So really setting off the colours to so you can see them perfectly. And I include the one on the left here, um, the Eurybia the, the on the left, because it is still the only time I have ever seen any metal mark on a flower. And even here, it wasn't actually nectaring, it was perched. It, it's a great shame it chose a flower where the colours clashed terribly with its own colours, but, you know, that's the way it was. But so it, it only struck me recently that this was the case and that I really didn't have any photographs of of, of metal marks with, with, with flowers of any sort, um, which is really strange because was, we think of, you know, where's the best place to find butterflies, where there's flowers for nectar. Um, but that just doesn't seem to apply to this family at all. I don't know how they get nourishment. I don't know if they get nourishment as adults. As, as you've seen, we, you, you see many of them taking salt from damp ground, but that's, that's all I've ever seen. Um, and, and on the right, you know, uh, the eye mark is just in as an example of another pattern that many of the uh, these metal marks exhibit. Some of them have different ground colours, but there are there are many species and probably well over a hundred very similar species here, which are become very difficult to identify correctly. And just to finally to give you more flavour of just how varied these metal marks can be. Uh, here are two that at first glance, you're thinking that they're a different family of butterflies altogether. So on the left, there's this Eusilasia is uh, very reminiscent in its, in its, in its size and, and the patterns on its wings to literally hundreds of lowland satyr butterflies from the Neotropics. So it, it certainly took me a little while to work out that this was indeed a metal mark. And similarly, the one on the right. Um, I, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, that's a nice, nice hair streak. I'd never seen one with an orange bar across it. And when I couldn't find any that, that had an orange bar across them, I then realized that, ah, it's not a hair streak at all. It's another metal mark, another form. So what an interesting family of butterflies. Um, but now we come to the biggest family of them all, uh, the nymphalids, the true brush fruits. Um, and this family is so big that it's actually broken down into, in this case, 11 subfamilies. Um, and so I'm going to really skim through. I'll show you just a very small number of examples from each of these, just to give you a flavor for the, the variety and richness uh, of, of, of these beautiful butterflies. So if you're, the one on this slide is, is, is a unica, it's one of the purple wings. But I'm going to start off with the, the satyrs which we would normally think of as uh, the browns, uh, the browns and ringlets uh, in, in European parlance. But these two are from deep, dark tropical forests where there really is very little light. And these butterflies are designed to hide. Um, fairly hatred on the left, you know, will manage that very well because it's, there's actually nothing to it. Uh, the wings are essentially transparent um, you can see the veins, and other than those few uh, eye spots at the end, uh, at the ends of the, uh, of the hind wing there, uh, the wings are completely clear. Um, 
Peretta on the right hand side has this wonderful pinkish glow to the, to the tail end of, of the hind wing, uh, again with eye spots there. And I think basically in both of these cases, the intent is that those eye spots are more visible to any potential predator uh, than the actual head of the insect itself. So again, misdirection is the name of the game in the survival of, of these lovely insects. So from the, the tropical forest floor, we now jump 3000 meters uh, up, up into the Andes again. And, and this family of satyrs have a, this, this wonderful shape. Um, the Karadis genus have this lovely elongated shape to the hind wings, um, which I had never come across before. Um, and they have, you know, when they open their wings, they have these wonderfully bright orange patterns or, or contrasting white and dark, white on dark background. So they, they, they really are, are quite attractive. Um, two more Karadi species, so that the, the, the same color palette is being used across each of these species with, with the, the orange and dark against the dark background. And uh, I say the same tailed shape in, in each of these. But, but some of these satyrs take, go to extraordinary lengths with their camouflage. Um, clearly, it's a good job that the panaboloid is on the left here that, that I saw against a leaf, otherwise it would have disappeared against uh, many, many backgrounds. But the, the, the intricacy of that pattern is something to you know really struggle even trying to focus on at times. But even that pales into insignificance with against the steroma satyr on the right, uh, because it's such an odd shape. Uh, it seems to have growths coming out of it in all sorts of different directions to break up the outline. Um, I wish I'd had more chance to look at this species, but it it literally was in front of me for no more than a few seconds. I I, I took I managed to get this photograph, uh, but unfortunately it, it then got buzzed by something else and and. That was the last I saw of it, so I, I never was able to sort of better understand what, what, what these apparent protuberances from, from the wings actually are. And these are just two examples of what lowland satyrs routinely look like, and I say that there are many, many hundreds of species of similar general patterns to these two. Um, Salvin's on the left is one of the larger ones uh, with, with slightly more bold orange on it than, than, it, than is the case in, in, for many species. Um, and Weymar's ringlet on the right, I particularly did. I just like the way the appearance with that, the, the ground colour, with that white stippling, it almost looks soft to the touch, doesn't it? Like that's a, probably quite a small species, that ringlet. And those of you familiar with uh, our own purple emperors will look at this and think, ah, I know what that is. And yes, it is an emperor. Um, and this is this is the only emperor I've seen in this part of the world, but it's it's a lot smaller than our, than our purple emperors, for example. It's only just over a couple of inches across. Um, but just like our purple emperors, what you're seeing is a is an iridescence. Uh, and so it that that bluey, that purpley blue is is dependent on the angle of the sun and the angle you are in relation to the butterfly in order to, to, to see it at its best. And these may look a bit familiar to you because they're painted ladies. They're not quite the same as our, our, the one we see in the UK. Uh, but these, these were both seen up in the Andes at 3,000 metres or so. And, and you may be aware that I mean, the, the, the painted lady we have in, in, in the UK uh, that breeds in the Atlas Mountains in North Africa at around about the same altitude, three, three and a half thousand meters. So the, the, these are, you know, it's not, a, not unusual by, by any means to see this, see these species at these altitudes. Um, the upper sides of these two species are, are relatively similar. If you look closely, you will pick differences, but the undersides uh, are, are clearly quite distinct with many more pale lines uh, on, on the underside of, of the Brazilian painted lady, you know, the eye spot pattern is different and the underside of the forewing is different as well. So, so the, the undersides differ by far more than, than the upper sides do. And the, we also see peacocks in the neotropics. Um, 
the, the scarlet peacock is is relatively you know it, it it's thin on the ground but I've, I've i've seen a few of them but the the white the white peacock is 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 fairly universal at, at, at low altitudes uh you, you'll you'll see it almost anywhere um in in, in gardens parks you know and everywhere else this group of butterflies are, are English name of beauties uh, pulls together a variety of different uh, genuses. Um, why they're called beauties, I, I don't know. Perhaps because they're, they're predominantly found posing on the side of trees. That, that's not what they're doing, of course, but that's what what they're perceived to be doing. Um, and you know, it, it's a good place to see them. You often get a get quite a nice view that way. So the Durs beauty on the left um, is unusual in, in in some ways because. You see that very broad white bar on 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 the on the underside of the forewing there, and that same white bar is on 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 the upper side as well. But surprisingly, the upper side, the rest of the upper side, is completely black. So it's unusual to, to have a, a black and white butterfly. Um, and then there's this detailed pattern underneath. the The pattern on the underside of the Blomfields on the right, you know, it is is lovely. Um, and, and much more color uh, in that one. However, you can see that this, the eye spots have done their job very well with this insect, because I reckon there's at least two bird pecks take, taken little bits out of the out of the wings there, where the the predator, the bird, has been pulled into striking the, in the wrong place on the butterfly, and clearly the butterfly has lived to tell the tale. And this, many of you will recognise, this is iconic in many ways. It's the malachite. Um, many of you will have seen it in, in, in uh, butterfly farms, um, butterfly houses, um, if you haven't been fortunate enough to actually see it in the wild. Um, these two images are, in fact, the same butterfly on the same leaf. Um, the image on the right, I simply flipped left to right, just so that they were facing each other here. And so what's the difference between them? Uh, when the first shot I took was the one on the left, uh, and the sun was just coming through the trees uh, behind it. So you get this wonderful light coming through, sort of almost like really sh shining through the green on, on, the, on the wings there. Two minutes later, the sun went behind a cloud, and so the insect closed its wings. Uh, and so your perception of what that colour is is completely different between light and shade. Yeah, you know, I decided I wanted to share both with you, so you could see that see the difference that that, that just your lighting conditions makes of the appearance of these butterflies. But as I say, just like an iconic butterfly for many people. This is one of the brighter butterflies that that, that one comes across, and again, really quite common. This is the orange map wing. Um, habitually, it will sit possibly on us on the right here with its wings open. Um, and really, really attractive, and lovely to look at. But you know, when when you do get to see the underside, isn't it lovely? Uh, that wonderfully intricate pattern uh, of, of lines, you know, and just set off with the, those small number of blue pupils uh, towards the tails and 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 the, the blue lines to the, towards the margin of the hind wing there. But just another, like so many, another lovely butterfly. So moving on to the next group, the um, all in the Marpesia family, the, the English name of dagger wings, uh, and it's pretty easy to see why, isn't it? Um, the, the very long tailed uh, insects, uh, and this particular one, obviously the many banded, you can see where where that name comes from. But I hope you can see in the image on the right that, that sitting you know, beside where the butterfly is sitting is actually the pupil case from which it just emerged just perhaps an hour earlier. Uh, so this butterfly has emerged. It's just about finished pumping up its wings, uh, but it hasn't yet taken its first flight. And this dagger wing, uh, it, it, not so much daggers, but it almost looks like stilettos coming out of the, the, the hind wings. Uh, on this ruddy dagger wing, uh, Petreus. Um, and it has this one, apart from the 
wonderful bright colors, but also this lovely wing shape, uh, the, the sort of very falcate wings, very cur strongly curved. And when it closes its wings, you can really see that, uh, see, see the shape really very clearly there. Again, just remarkable, you know, and what the purpose of the tails in is, who knows, I'm not sure they have a purpose other than to, to please us. And, and just by way of contrast, the, the, this, this Marpesia, the, the dark lagger wing, it is, is much more subdued, slightly shorter tails. Uh, but uh, I, I, I hope this comes through on your screens, but there's a, a really nice sort of purple sheen to the underside of this species, which, you know, in the, in the light that I was photographing it, you know, and that, that, that really appealed to me. Moving on again, the, the, the next family of the, the Adelphas, all, all going by the English name of the sisters, you know, and there are several dozen uh, uh, in this family, all with minor variations in, in, in their appearance. And, and, and one of the most common that one sees is this one, Iphiclus, going by the English name of the Pointer sister. Um, all of these uh, Adelphas have a similar pattern on, with one or two ex exceptions of a similar pattern on the underwing, um, but the, the upper sides differ in the extent of that white bar and just where the orange is uh, on the wings. So this next species, you'll see that the white only extends essentially over the hind wings and then is replaced by orange uh, on the rest of the forewings in, in this species, Jordan I. But the, the underwing is essentially similar to what I just showed. And there is at least one uh, species without any point. Uh, this, this is Mesentina. Uh, and as you can see, we've just got the orange, uh, but isn't the, you know, this again is a very, very fresh specimen as you can probably tell, but the, the orange on the underside just about glows in, in, in the light. You know, and this was photographed in. But things get, uh, even more exciting as we move on to this next family, the, the Chiraxes, um, otherwise known as the leaf wings. Um, these are predominantly sort of forest canopy species. Um, and, and you more often than not, you'll see them flying around the tops of trees and never get a good look at them. But like many species, they can be tempted down to the ground by things that we would consider noxious. Uh, I won't go into detail, I'll leave it to your imagination. Uh, but in this case, look at this, this wonderful Propona, Laertes, um, that, that, that two-tone blue on the upper side. Um, it's, the, the paler blue is essentially fixed. So when you see the butterfly flying, uh, you will see that blue color, but the, the darker blue is an iridescence. So again, that, that is you know, dependent on your angle to the butterfly and the angle that, that, that the, the light is coming in. Um, but seeing the, the, the two tones together is, is, is fascinating like that. And this must be the best example of a leaf mimic butterfly I have ever, certainly ever seen in my life, uh, but possibly also ever seen in a, even looking at books. Um, this is just utterly stunning, uh, Zeritis itis. Um, how how this has you know evolved isn't nature just gobsmacking at times you know you could not if you were designing it yourself you could not make a better leaf mimic than that and then you look to the top left there and you think that's the same butterfly when it opens its wings it is this wonderful orange color um and so when it wants to be seen gosh it is seen uh, but when it doesn't it can hide away and, and, and just be a leaf, uh, just really quite utterly stunning, utterly stunning. Many of the Chiraxes, rather than trying to mimic leaves, just try to blend into any sort of background. Um, and, and again, there are many Memphis uh, species uh, which do just that. I include this this one because Whilst most of the most times you see these, they keep their wings closed and you don't get to see the upper side. On the odd occasion where you do get them to open their wings, you can see the, these wonderful colors to them. In many cases, the, there's, there's blues and or greens as, as in this one, the Acidalia. 
but this is a butterfly that just shouts, look at me. Uh, and wow, is this a stunner? Um, this is a big butterfly. Uh, this butterfly is perhaps what, three and a half, four inch wingspan, certainly three and a half. Um, the upper wings, as you can see, just uh, are bright blue and red. Um, and the, the red carries through to the underside there. And then that wonderful clear pattern on the underside. So this is clearly not a butterfly designed for camouflage. This is a butterfly that says, hey, look at me. And hey, don't bother eating me because I'm poisonous. Um, it's, it, it really is a stunning, stunning insect. It was the size of it that, that, that really uh, floored me. I expected anything like that to be much smaller. You know, and the icing on the cake, so to speak, is the color of the proboscis, which I hope you can see on your screen, which is that, that wonderful pink color. So again, moving quickly on, um, moving on to the Heliconias. Um, these, these uh, think of English names as, as the long wings and the fritillaries. Uh, and again, I've jumped back up from the lowlands to the highlands, and, and this is back up about 3,000 metres in the Andes with a species called the Andean silver spot. And you can see how it gets the silver spot name, can't you, with that lovely pattern on the underside of the wings. And the upper side, you know, you would think it'd be hard to find camouflage for that colour, but, but look at the colour of the rocks, the wet rocks that that's sitting on. There's not much difference in the orange colour there between the rocks and the butterfly itself. But this same family, Dione, uh, has another representative that, that's very, very common at lower altitudes. And this is the Gulf fritillary, um, a common species from Central America southwards, and perhaps even further north than that. Um, but again, you can see the similarity in the underwing pattern. Um, not lovely, lovely bold white spots across the wings. And, and, and in, I was just fortunate to come across this mating pair again in the Botanic Gardens at Santa Cruz um, uh, with the, the female who is obviously exceedingly fresh, uh, sit with its wings open while the male had, had, had his wings closed. So just the, the perfect pose to, to, to see the butterfly at its best. And when you think of long wings, there aren't many butterflies that give that impression more than the Julia. Um, this is, you know, you know, it almost lo looks like there are no hind wings, but clearly there are. It's just the design of the butterfly means that the, the wings don't protrude beyond the end of the, of the, of the thorax of the insect. Um, and so your perception is of something that's long and thin. You know, so again, we're, we're looking at, you know, um, what nine centimeters, so three, three and a half inch wingspan here. Um, but a, a really elegant butterfly, you know, and, and, and when, when they're fresh like this, they, they're, again, they're, they're lovely. But it, just because they're so long and thin, it seems odd to see them flying. But similarly, but just gobsmacking, um, is this species here. And, and no, I'm not showing you another malachite. This is much bigger than a malachite. This is the Dido long wing. Um, so it, it, it's it's bigger than, than what I just showed you, the Julian. Um, but as you can see, similar concept to the malachite, but much bigger and bolder and brighter. Um, and the, the brightness of, of the upper side in the sunshine, it, it, it really glows, it really glows. And when the wings are closed and the sun's shining through them, I, I look at I, I, it's almost like looking at stained glass. Uh, it, it it really is quite a quite an odd feeling to 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 look at it. It it it, it really is one of my favourite species. I, I, I've seen this up up in Central America before, uh, but to to see these down in in Bolivia this, this this last year now was was really special. Some of the hell some of the Heliconians are are as you can see. Um, combinations of white and red on a dark background. Now, these are both the same species, the Heliconia serrato, uh, but different subspecies of, of that species, you know, with, with quite, quite a, quite, clearly quite different patterns. Uh, so it's remarkable that they are the same species. Uh, the, 
the, the more normal patterns are the ones on the bottom left. Um, and I, I only seen the, the one example of Vunustas at the top there. Again, the, when, when I've seen these, these have been relatively low. And I've shown you reds, so, so, so here's blue. Uh, some of the, the long wings uh, have, have blue. In this case with Sarah, that, that blue is an iridescence. It's, it's, not, it's not hard and fixed. Uh, in, in the colouring of the butterfly. Um, so as you can see on the left, you can't see the, the blue at that angle, but what you can see is that lovely pattern of, of, of red dots that, 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 that runs across the, the base of the, of the wings there. But most of the heliconias, most of these long wings are this sort of pattern, you know, this sort of colourway, orange and black with, with some paler colours, with, with fairly long wings and, you know, um, and there are several hundred species that look very similar. So it can be really quite a challenge to, uh, to identify and pick, properly identify them at least. Um, and things get more complicated because these are not heligonias. These are a different family altogether, uh, but you can see the same, same shape, um, similar sort of size, similar colorway. Um, these are the common tiger, Lycanitis polymnia. Um, but as I say, they're not uh, members of the, the heliconias, the long wings. These are ethomeone, which go by the English name, clear wings. Um, clearly something went wrong with the English nomenclature um, in that when this family was first named, uh, perhaps it wasn't recognized that, that many of the species that are in this clear wings family actually do not have clear wings. So, it, it all adds to the confusion in trying to identify things and making sure that you're properly assigning names to things. But of course, many of the clear wings do have clear wings. Well, what do we mean by clear wings? Um, the butterfly on the left, as you can see, there are certainly very clear areas in the wings. Butterfly on the right, it's not clear, they're sort of pearlescent instead. Uh, and as you can see, the, this particular species has that lovely line of blue spots around the outside. Some of them appear very delicate, like the species on the left, whereas the Dersena on the right really gives the impression of being chunky and bold, uh, despite being having these clear wings. But whenever you think about clear wing butterflies, you, you think of, you're lucky if you find one, um, very lucky if you find two. Um, you think we think of them as very, very low, low numbers, widely spread. Um, however, in Bolivia, we came across this. Um, and it's very difficult to portray this accurately and well enough in a photograph, because we reckon there must have been several thousand of, of these clear wings all roosting together. You know, there were many still flying. Um, it was just awesome, mind-boggling in, in so many dimensions. Um, when we came home, I spoke to a friend of mine who's a, a neotropical butterfly expert, and he'd never come across anything like this. Uh, but he hypothesized that what was happening was, uh, we'd had a change in the weather. Before we arrived at this site, it had been hot for several days. When we got there, there was a cold front going over. So the temperature had dropped substantially. And all these butterflies were congregating in an area above a stream uh, where it was cool and, and, and basically humid. Um, and he hypothesized that they were going into estivation, which is a type of hibernation. They said that they were going to sit it out and wait for the sun to come back and the temperatures to warm up again. Um, but the, what strikes me more than anything else with this is simply, where have they all come from? Who knew there were so many in these woods? Uh, and I don't know that, you know, will anybody ever see that, that phenomenon again? So, you wouldn't forgive me if I didn't show you a blue morpho. So here you are. Here is a blue morpho. Uh, this is morpho Achilles. Um, so you, I hope you've seen, been lucky enough to see morphos in butterfly forms and the like. But aren't they wonderful? Um, they're much nicer in the real world. And when they're flying free, you know, five-inch wingspan, lazy flight, just just meandering through the dappled shade in a woodland. It, it, it's just the most wonderful sight. But there's, there's many species of morpho. So just to quickly, another couple. 
the more fool on the right retinol. We, I've only seen this one example, um, but I would love to see another fresher butterfly because clearly this was old and damaged. But look at the wing shape, it, much longer winged than, than the other morphos. This species has a six inch wingspan and that upper side is that wonderful metallic blue over the entire wings. So that must be a real stunner to, to see uh, in, in, the, in a fresh state. And just by contrast, there are brown morphos, uh, which have there are a few blue scales on this, but, but, but really very few indeed. Similar to the, the morphos, the, the, the family, the Brasolini are what the English name of the owls. And why are they called owls? Well, that's because they come, they only start to fly when it starts to get dark. Uh, they'll spend the day, like this one, sitting on the side of a tree. Um, but when it starts to get dark, they, they will start to fly. Um, I don't understand why. I've never uh, looked into the details of that. But again, some of these are very large. This this is actually larger than the blue morpho I showed you. This has a five and a half inch wingspan. Um, and this was clearly, again, a, a very fresh specimen. But look at that eye spot. You know, that's going to scare off most predators, isn't it? There are other species of owls. Um, the bio owl on the left is, is unusual in its shape and pattern. It, it's different from all the rest of the owls. Um, I don't understand the biology to know how it's classed as one of the owls, but it is. Um, the owlet on the right um, has just such a gorgeous pattern. It's about half the size uh, of the, the, the giant I showed you. So but still two and a half inch wingspan here. Um, but what struck me, and again, I hope I can, you can see it on your screens, is the blue veining um, on, on that underwing. And not only had the blue vein, but the proboscis is blue to match. You know, uh, you know, again, words fail me at times, it's just how nature arrives at, at, at these things. And so we come to the last family, saving the best to last in many ways. Um, so I'm going to start off here with th this olive wing, um, the O'Brienus olive wing. And on the right, you can see what leads to its name and you can see how well that's going to be camouflaged uh, in, in, in any sort of forest environment. But my gosh, when it opens its wings, uh, you can certainly see it. Uh, and it's, it, it's screaming, look at me. Um, and, and isn't it wonderful? And that combination of blue and orange is also on this blue frosted banner. And what a wonderful pattern of orange spots. They're huge, uh, just running across the wingspan like that. And that lovely ring of blue spots around, around the tail end of the hindwing. Um, but again, you've got the, the now you see me, now you don't approach to a butterfly. Wings closed, it's gone. Opens its wings, wow, in your face. That blue and orange uh, is in other families as well. The, the, the sailors, the, the dynamini family, are usually have, have, have a combination of, of blue in some form on the top, and the undersides usually have orange, sometimes with blue, but usually with, with some white underneath. Really attractive small butterflies, the, the sailors. I couldn't omit all the crackers. So here's a, an example cracker, again, with blue on it. This is the Amazon blue cracker. Um, these are most often found, as you can see here, perched on the side of a tree. And they're called crackers. Why? Because they can make a crackling sound with their wings. I don't know another butterfly that can make a sound uh, deliberately like that. Um, but I, I, I wish I'd, I'd, I'd been able to hear a cracker doing this, but that's something for another day, perhaps. But pièce de résistance time, it's time to show you some 88s. Um, these are, for many people, just the iconic uh, butterfly. Um, Called 88 for, for obvious reasons. You can you can see the, the, the shape of the pattern on the underwing here. Um, in this example, you know, that, that underwing with that lovely pale blue infill to the to the numbers, but look how bright the upper sides are, uh, with the bright reds and, 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 and the blues, just stunning. And as there are there are many, many 88, so I'm just going to show you a few. This, this Eunomia, um, 
the 88 has a sort of almost a purple infill that, that, that clashes slightly, I would say, with the blue on, on, on the, the margin. Um, but nonetheless, an, an absolute, they're all stunning. They're all stunning. Astaspes here has, has this yellow ground color, um, again, with blue infill to, to the numerals. The number is getting a bit more cryptic now as we get to Sinusura, you know, and we've also got this, this, this extra strange line of dots uh, distinguishing it from, from the other 88s that I've shown you. But, but look how the spots on the body of the butterfly are, are, are reflecting the, the, the dots elsewhere on the body. So it, it sorry, elsewhere on the wings. So it really breaks up the, the shape and make, confuses any sort of predator. And again, look how bright the upper side of this Serrano 88 is. Um, it, it, again, it, it, it's just so bright. And we were fortunate with this one. You can see it, it chose to be on this sort of straw uh, when we saw it. Um, and and as, you know, as a consequence, we got this lovely pale background uh, to see the butterfly at its best, you know, and to show off that, that incredibly, incredible underwing pattern. And by the time we get to Hesperus, we've actually lost the 80 altogether, or the 88, uh, and we don't have a number shape. Uh, but nonetheless, we've got this, again, this wonderful mixture of reds and blues on the upper wings and this lovely pattern underneath. Uh, and in this case, we've got blue eyes to go with it. But in my view, saving the very best to last uh, is this, it's actually a false number wing. It's not a true 88. Um, it comes from a different family, but this 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 insect was must be so fresh, you know, the crispness of the colours, the brightness of the colours, you know, it it I look at it in all. It, it is just utterly gobsmacking, um, and not surprisingly, I, I got a photograph of this on on my wall at the house. So with that, I'll say thank you. Um, thank you for staying with me. Um, I hope I've been able to enthuse you with the, the joys that neotropical butterflies can bring. Thank you. Ian, well, thank you so much for that. That was absolutely amazing. Some stunning photographs and just a brilliant uh, commentary on, on the butterflies you saw. Um, I don't think we've got any questions in the in the chat yet, but um, we're very, very open for um anybody that wants to ask a question um if you'd like to um unmute yourself and um if you want to um show us yourself on camera and and ask a question then um please do who liz would you like to go first yeah. ian what time of day do you find you see the butterflies do you when i'm awake, hmm? when I'm awake. Yeah, but I mean, is it first thing in when you, when they're on the ground? Is it first thing in the morning? It depends on where you are. It, it really depends on where you are and, and what the local weather conditions are. Sometimes morning is best. Um, sometimes late afternoon is best. You know, in in some of these habitats, it can be um, it can get too hot across the middle of the day. Yeah. So, uh, but then again, some species like it when it's hot. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I was in Thailand in November and there were some beautiful butterflies, but they just didn't stop. I mean, mm. I saw some hair streaks on the ground, but there wasn't a hope in hell of getting a photo, let alone, well, let alone identifying them. So yeah. I just I'm amazed how you, you managed to capture them. I just... Um, well, you don't see the ones that get away, do you? Yeah, I know, but... <laughs> it, yeah, it's just amazing. And I just thought, well, there must be some sort, whether it's the morning or evening, but I certainly know that that middle of the day was hopeless. Yeah, well, ba basically, we tend to be out all day. Right. You know, um, and, and we're, you know, the, the, these trips I go on are not just looking at butterflies. We're looking at birds and plants and everything else. You know, so we're out all, all day. We, we, we're up, you know, from dawn till dusk, basically. And then often... The night walk as well for moths and other insects you know so that it, it it's a full-on experience um and, and of course 
what you, what you're doing is you're you're optimizing your chance of seeing things simply by being out there all day you know and you know the the years of practice i've had i've i've got fairly good at being able to grab a quick photo of something you know and then move in a bit close for a better photo if i can um sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but as you say a lot of species you just you just don't stand a chance of getting a photo of you know so it it really is you know it, it it's all luck it all comes down to luck you know and if you can find somewhere that they're coming down either to take moisture or for feeding you know like those chiraxes um you know if you can find somewhere where they're coming that they're, they're brought down that then then that's your best chance right i think yeah. it doesn't help that um i'm the only one that's interested <laughs> Right. Anyone else got a question they'd like to ask um, Ian? Richard. Oh, hi there, Ian. That was amazing. I've, um, I've never seen such a range of colours and uh, I didn't truly believe there were so many varieties in, in two countries in South America. I'll have to put it down as a, a trip for um, next year or the year after, get away from this cold weather. Well, Thank you very much. I, 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 as you see, I, I would clearly recommend it. Yeah. Cool. Um, who else would like to ask a question? Um, we've got a question from Caroline in the uh, the comments, which is, "What is the travel company that organised such a lovely trip?" <laughs> um. Both of these trips were organised by a company called Green Tours. Right, they weren't. They're one of the ones that Butterfly Conservation has a relationship with, didn't they? Because I know that no, they no, appear in the magazine company. quite a bit. No, no, different company. Oh, right. You're okay. confusing green. With green. You're confusing that with Green Wings. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, but Green Green Tours are the Green Tours. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. Anyone else got a question, Rian, before we wrap up? I suppose just having a look, see if we've got any more messages in the um any more in the messages. Um uh, I've got a question from Chris. I'm having a bit of trouble with my mouse. <laughs> Chris has said, superb photography, and I enjoyed your appreciation of the colours and explanations of the camouflage. When I visited butterfly farms, the flight of the tropical butterflies seems to be slow and gentle oh. compared to our native species, perhaps because the rainforest shelters them from the wind. Is this generally true, or does it apply only to a few species they choose to show? Probably the latter. Um, you know, and also you, you think about the, the difference, even a butterfly house is probably going to be cool to to many of these species, so they're perhaps not not in optimal conditions, shall we say. They're probably not behaving the same way that they would, you know, in a natural environment, you know, but then it, it, it's also part of, you know, what are they showing you in a butterfly house? It's the species that, that are easier to breed. You know, and easier to keep, you know, and 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 obviously some of the the showier ones as well. You know, things that are fast flying, etc. They're they're not going to um, have so much success in being able to get hold of them in the first place to breed them and and, and show them in in the farm. Mm. The proponents fly very very fast, and the clear wings mm. fly very very slow. And everything else flies in between. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good generalization, Brian. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've caught many of the clear wing butterflies. Just put my hand underneath them when they come flying by, because right. they, they they fly so slowly and delicately. They're they're fantastic. Yeah, can't yeah. do that with a proponent though. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wish. <laughs> um, Larissa's asked a question, Ian. Um, whether you'd recommend a good book for people to study for neotropical butterflies? I think you need a very large book. Um, <laughs> um, I, I tend to use um, online resources instead. Um, I mean, 
mean, as I said at the start, when you're looking at, you know, thousands of species, you know, um, but neotropicalbutterflies.com uh, com has, yeah, butterflies of the world. That's a good place to start. Thank, thank you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so if you want a book, then, then butterflies of the world, you know, has has a lot a lot of information. I mean, it's certainly a lot of photographs in it. Um, but if you want to to try and work your way through the families and just see, then um, uh, I'm just bear with me a second. I just need to remind myself the name of a website. Um, yeah, neotropicalbutterflies.com. Right. Um, is is very good. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, butterfliesofamerica.com has essentially has everything, but because it has everything, it's very you can't see the wood for the trees. You've, you've got to know what you're looking for in the first place. Um, so neotropicalbutterflies.com is it, it's um, it, it is probably the best place to start, you know, for for somebody. Right. I wanted to ask a question about. Um conservation of butterflies in this area i mean are there just so many butterflies everywhere that nobody needs to bother to conserve them or uh, as i often hear that horror stories of vast chunks of rainforests being chopped down in south mm. america it, it, uh, are, are the are some of these butterflies being threatened by habitat loss no doubt the answer is yes in different places um it depends how you know how enlightened the country is. Um, I think I mean, Bolivia has large areas that are protected now um, and is very proud of its natural heritage. Uh, but that said, there's other parts where, you know, where there isn't the protection and the human pressure is the same across the planet. You know, so in the absence of any sort of formal protection in the form of national parks and the like, then then it's easy for people to you know, to uh, stake claims on land. You know, I mean, one of the one of the areas we were in in, in Bolivia, uh, just in, you know, in the Andes, in fact, was already marked out in plots. You know, clearly for people to, you know, assuming that people were going to come and take them. You know, what they would do with them. You know, because we were you talking of the, the, the a fairly steep hillside, mostly rocky, um, lots of nice, you know butterflies and hummingbirds and things but not much not much that you could do from an agricultural perspective so it's difficult to know what people would do with it but nothing can be rolled out when I mean, we know about slash and burn everywhere yeah well it's um great great to hear about somewhere where there's so many butterflies and they're they they seem to be doing well um, so, um quite quite a contrast to at home indeed indeed so as, as does anyone else have a, a, a last question before we um we wrap up no signs so um well i suppose it just leaves me to say thank you ever so much ian for your um amazing talk there's uh, a whole host of lovely comments that are in the uh, in the chat which i hope you'll have a chance to read before we uh, before we finish scrolling as you talk <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, I think, as I said earlier, the, the, the recording should be up on our um, Hearts of Middlesex Butterfly Conservation YouTube channel um, tomorrow. If you, if you can't find it, there, there'll be a link through from our the branch website. Um, and also on the YouTube channel, we'll, you, you can find Ian's uh, talk last year on Butterflies of Ghana, which was was equally stunning. So if, if, you, if you haven't seen that and you enjoyed tonight, then do have a look out for the, uh, the Ghana talk. Uh, that, that reminds me, Annie, I was going to ask if you've got any holidays planned this year. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I'm going in two and a half weeks. Uh, get away from the cold weather. Uh, I'm actually going to back to the Andes, but the northern end in Colombia. Ah, fantastic. Well, cool. um, Hopefully for more butterflies and hummingbirds. Well, we shall, we shall hope, hope Liz manages to persuade you to come back for another talk next year. It's uh, it was really, really spectacular. So thanks ever so much for everybody that's uh, stuck it through to the end. Um, and um, yeah, hope to um, to see you at uh, one of our, our future talks in this series or, or indeed our, our Members' Day um, on the 6th of April. So, um, 
thanks very much for for coming tonight thanks everybody bye <laughs> bye You're still recording, Malcolm. Um, yeah, I'll um, I'll end the um, recording. <laughs>